So when you power up your computer system or reboot your computer system, the first thing that runs is not the operating system. It is another program named the bootstrap, which is also called the firmware. The bootstrap resides either on ROM or EEPROM, and it is the first thing, as I said, that runs. And it looks around, of course, it doesn't look around, it just looks at a specific space, address, on the disk, where your kernel is. So it starts, it looks at the starting address of the kernel and loads the kernel. That's how your operating system starts running. For example, if you have, say, a dual boot system with both Linux and Windows installed on the same computer, it is the bootstrap that realizes that there are actually two kernels on the uh, disk, which are Windows and Linux, and which one to start with, either you have one set as default, or if not, it will display you a menu to pick the correct operating system. Those of you who have already installed uh, multiple uh, operating systems on their computers, know that there's something like either Lilo or Grub, whatever, uh, which is actually a boot manager, which is triggered by the bootstrap. And it displays a list saying, do you want to run Linux or Windows or this version of Linux, whatever, these installations, and you pick one of them. If there's a single uh, operating system installed on your computer system, of course, then there's no question, so the bootstrap immediately starts with that one. But as I said, it is the bootstrap that finds the uh, finds where the uh, kernel is and loads the kernel. Only after the whole kernel has been loaded, the bootstrap passes the control to the kernel. And from that point on, it is the kernel, it's the operating system managing everything. Bootstrap is done, it passes the control to the kernel, and that's it. But before doing it, before passing the loading the kernel and passing the control to the kernel, there is actually yet another thing that the uh, bootstrap does. And it, what it does is it initializes all aspects of the system, which means, for example, it will find uh, how many CPUs you have, how many cores you have on those CPUs, how much memory you have on your computer system which disks are available and what type of disks they are. Is that a typical hard disk or an SSD disk or a USB disk? Is it connected over USB or SATA over which port? Uh, and all this kind of basic things, typically about the hardware, they are detected by the uh, bootstrap program and the kernel is informed about that for example the kernel needs to know how much memory is available before it starts doing anything and all this information is provided to the kernel by the bootstrap program so it's a small but very basic thing uh, that uh, manages that starts actually the computer system so, if you look at the organization of your computer system, you have one or more CPUs, some memory, which is typically composed of several memory chips, uh, device controllers that are managing the devices. For example, you have a disk controller, which manages all the disks. You could have multiple disks, but typically they, could be, uh, they would be controlled over a single disk controller so that uh, the CPU knows how to communicate with those disks. The CPU does not directly communicate with the disks, but it would be communicating, for example, with the disk controller. We will later see that there are variations of this, by the way. Uh, for all the USB devices, typically there is a USB controller uh, 
to which all these USB devices are connected. Similar for graphics adapter, the CPU communicates with the graphics adapter, which could be supporting one or more uh, monitors that are connecting. You could, of course, have a GPU control card uh, and memory, whatever. All these are actually the components of a computer system. And the CPU will be communicating with all of these devices through these typically controllers so that they're uh, used uh, in the most efficient manner in a concurrent manner. The most important thing is we let the I.O. devices and the CPU run or execute concurrently. Concurrently means doing things at the very same time. This is very important. If I.O. devices were to sit idle while the CPU is working, that would mean the CPU would sit idle when the I.O. devices are working. We will mention this many times in this course, but the I.O. devices are typically hundreds, uh, sorry, thousands of times slower than the CPU. So what you would like to do is for higher uh, efficiency, you would like to run the I.O. devices, run concurrently among themselves, like the disk and the printer and the uh, monitor typically would be running, would be doing things at the same time. Also, while these are doing I.O., the CPU also keeps running. And again, the operating system that's providing this. The, each of the device controllers is typically in charge of a particular type of device. Like, as we discussed uh, in the previous slide, the disk controller is responsible for managing disks, all of them. Okay, so you could have disks of different brands. You could uh, get a disk from Seagate, another one from Western Digital. And, well, they should both be working with the CPU independent of the brand. Okay, so it is a disk controller, which is hiding all the details about this. And the CPU just says, I want to read this from the disk or I want to write this to the disk. And I don't care about the brand of the disk or how many cylinders it has, where individual uh, bits and pieces of information is. It is up to the disk controller to retrieve that. And uh, more important, you have to control the disk. That's why it's called a disk controller. What we mean by the disk controller is, we're going to discuss it shortly, but the disk controller has to deal with details like, I have to read from this specific cylinder on the disk, and that cylinder is not currently under the read-write head. So I have to move the read-write head to that specific position. How do you manage that? It's no business of the CPU. The CPU does not want to deal with that detail. So it tells the disk controller to read this much data from that place on the disk. And that's it. It is left to the disk controller to send the correct electrical signals to the disk device to make sure that that piece of information is transferred to the CPU. Similar is true for USB controllers, but this time we're not talking about rotation of the disk splatters. We're talking about how you retrieve information or send information to these USB devices. Similar is true for the monitor. I don't care about how you get something displayed on a specific pixel on the screen. I just want it done. It is the role of the graphics adapter to send the control signals over VGA, uh, VGA connectors or HDMI connector. It's quite different. And the CPU does not want to know how to handle VGA or HDMI. 
it is left to the graphics adapter to manage all that. So that's why we have different device controllers for different types of uh, devices. A graphics card does not know how to handle a disk and the disk controller does not know how to handle a monitor. That's why for each type, for each class, there is a different uh, device controller. Each device controller has its own local buffer and there is a reason for that. Again, we're going to discuss it in more detail soon. But reading that much data from the disk takes some time and the CPU doesn't want to sit idle until that data is read because it really takes very, slow, uh, very long time to read that information. So the CPU will just tell the device controller to read that much data from that specific address and say, let me know when you read it and go and deal with another task. While this task is trying to read this data, it, the CPU will execute another task for higher efficiency. And when the device controller has read all that data, it will inform the CPU saying, the data you requested, now it's ready. I can give you that data when you're available. To be able to do that, the device controller should have stored all that data temporarily in a specific space. And that's its local buffer. When the CPU says, okay, now I'm ready. Tell me what you have read. The device controller will not go to the disk now because it has already retrieved that data, which was a slow process, and place it in its local buffer from where it can read very fast and tell the CPU in a fast manner. Reading from the buffer is a fast operation, but transferring the data from the disk to that local buffer, that's a slow operation. During that slow operation, we don't want to keep the CPU busy. That's the idea. So the CPU moves the data from or to the main memory uh, from these local buffers. Okay. So when you want to read something from the disk to a variable in memory, for example, first the device controller will retrieve that data from the disk device into the device controller's local buffers. Tell the CPU about that. And then the CPU will either move it or later we're going to see that it gets it moved uh, by some other means to that variable. And these are all done just to have higher performance. The I.O. is from device to the local buffer of that controller, as we discussed. And the device controller, when that data requested has been fully transferred into that local buffer, it informs the CPU. And the way to do it is CPU is, remember, dealing with other processes because this process was waiting for the data. So that process is in the waiting state and the CPU is dealing with the other processes. Now, somehow we need to tell, the device controller needs to tell the CPU that the data is ready. And what it does for that is it has to interrupt the CPU saying, sorry, but the data you requested, now it's ready. That's called an interrupt. So we say the device controller raises an interrupt to the CPU. And the CPU, when interrupted, will uh, respond to that interrupt, not immediately when it is uh, available, and say, okay, what's the deal? Why are you interrupting me? And the device controller will say, see, this is what you requested. Here it is in this local buffer. This much data is ready. And then the CPU decides what to do with that data. So that's how things are actually being executed. So for these data, there are different ways of handling uh, the interrupts we're going to discuss. But the most frequently used way is we make use of what's called an interrupt vector. Because 
In a computer system, we have different types of interrupts. We're not only reading from the disk. We're trying to write something or draw something on the screen. We want to send something over the internet. We want to re uh, receive something over the internet, but I don't know when it will come. So when the data comes, just let me know. All these are done, are achieved by different interrupt service routines. An interrupt service routine is actually a function that does what is required by the type of interrupt. As I said, there are different types of interrupts. Therefore, there should be different functions that are implementing the, those tasks, those functionalities. These functions are called interrupt service routines. These are different functions in different places. So we should know which function for which interrupt is where. And it's the interrupt vector saying this interrupt, uh, the interrupt service routine for this interrupt is here. The interrupt service routine for this interrupt is here. For this one, it's here. So it's the interrupt vector which contains the address of these interrupt service routines. And raising an interrupt actually means which interrupt we're talking about. So since it's a vector like an array, we're talking about the index. So interrupt number 13 is the interrupt that at index 13, you go to that index, you will find where that function is. If you want to modify the interrupt here, which is by the way possible, it's a tricky thing, but you can do it and you will see how to do it. You can just write a new interrupt service routine, say here, and update the address here, saying don't go here anymore, now go here, and it will work. The interrupt architecture uh, should save the address of the interrupted instruction because the CPU was dealing with this and you interrupt the CPU saying, hey, the data re you requested is now ready. Now the CPU should remember that it was doing something here. So keep a track of that. Remember where it was. And now switch to the interrupt service routine to execute what the interrupt service routine says. Like it says, now transfer from the local buffer of this device controller to this place in main memory. It will do that. And when it is done with the interrupt, it needs to return to where it was left. This is just like a, a function being called. You have to remember where the function was called so that you can return to that. So you need to save this address so that you can later return here and continue from where you were left. Uh, now, what we discussed was actually always the interrupts that were created by the hardware, created by the disk controllers, the graphics adapter, USB controller, whatever. These were all triggered by the hardware. But it is possible that a software, a process, could also be generating an interrupt. We will call the ones that are created by the hardware as interrupts and the ones that are created by the software, either as a trap or an exception. Well, you will remember the word exception from, for example, your Java course. That was really a kind of a software interrupt. In Java, we typically use the name exception. In uh, general, we use uh, the uh, word trap, same thing. And such an operating system is called an interrupt-driven operating system, almost all operating systems you will see, modern operating systems are interrupt-driven systems. So, uh, as we said, while CPU was dealing with something else and you interrupt it, uh, it will need to remember where it was. And in general, the CPU will typically try to preserve its state 
uh, by storing the registers. The CPU was dealing with, say, process P1. It uh, During that time, the registers in the CPU had some specific values. And on behalf of process P2, which had earlier made an I.O. request, the disk controller, say, interrupts the CPU saying, the data you requested for P2 is now available. But the CPU is currently dealing with P1. If it directly starts executing the interrupt service routine for P1, sorry, P, for P2, for the disk I.O. operation, while the CPU is doing that, executing those instructions, of course the registers in the CPU would change. And that would affect, of course, process P1 because it had set those registers and those values in the registers have changed because of the interrupt service routine acting on behalf of another process. So when it returns, the register values would be uh, different, so it would do something different. For this not to happen, before switching to that interrupt service routine, the CPU writes, it does not remember only where it was, it has to remember the register values. So it will write the register values, store them somewhere, and then switch to the interrupt service routine, execute the instructions in the interrupt service routine, and when it is done, it will go back and look at that place, it will learn where it was left in P1, and also learn what the register values there. So it would restore the register values. Only after that, it can resume the execution of P1. So all this is what this first statement here says. Uh, the system should determine which type of interrupt has occurred. Is it from the disk controller? or USB controller, or graphics adapter, or network controller, whatever. So, the uh, operating system either checks each device one by one. Did you interrupt me? No. Did you interrupt me? No. Did you? Did you? Did you? This is called polling, because you're polling the devices one by one, asking them one by one to see if they had a request for an interrupt service. Or a better way is now, while the device is interrupting, it also gives the information saying which interrupt service routine it wants to get executed. It does not know where the interrupt uh, service routines are, but it knows the interrupt number. For example, the, uh, this controller would say, would say I have an interrupt, and my interrupt is for disk I.O. So it would send the code for disk I.O., the index in that interrupt vector, for the disk I.O. interrupt service routine. So when the CPU is interrupted, the first thing it understands is it's interrupted. This is just like poking the CPU, saying, hey. So when you poke the CPU, saying, hey, the CPU will turn around and say, what's it? And the, it will see that the interrupt service routine that was requested is, say, number 13. It will first store the contents of uh, the registers, including the program counter, somewhere so that it can resume back, go to interrupt vector, find element 13, from there, it will learn where the service routine is, jump there, execute that service routine. When it is done with the service routine, it will go back to the place where it had earlier stored the state of the CPU, the values of all registers, reload them into the registers. And finally, because of the program counter, it will find which instruction it should continue with and resume the execution of process P1 successfully. This type is called vectored interrupt. 
Note that this time, the CPU did not check the devices one by one because the device that was making the interrupt request already told you which interrupt it was. So this is faster. You don't need to go one by one. This is a faster way of dealing with the interrupts. But the system is now a little bit more complex But because this time it's not sufficient to raise the flag for an interrupt on one uh, communication line. But you should in parallel also send a interrupt number which is an index into the uh, interrupt vector. It's a slightly more complicated hardware design, but it has better performance. Also note that in polling, we have another disadvantage, which is your devices are in a specific sequence. They are numbered device 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, whatever. If you always start polling from device 0, the devices with smaller uh, IDs would be advantaged over the ones with larger IDs because you always start from 0, 1, 2. So, for example, if device 2 is making device, uh, sorry, interrupt requests very often, you'd uh, always prefer device 2 over device 6. Okay. An alternative would be, well, last time you service device 2, the next time you get another interrupt, you continue from there. But then this would be fair, but it would not have always better performance because as we will see later, some devices should have higher priority. They should be able to uh, execute more often, but this will not allow that. So typically, in other words, a vector interrupt system is better, although the polled interrupt system is easier to implement. Anyways, this slightly explains how uh, things are running. So we have the CPU and I.O. devices for the sake of the example. Here let's assume there's a single I.O. device and we have a single CPU with a single core, a very basic simple system. The CPU is in one of the two states. It's either a user process is executing or an I.O. Uh, interrupt has occurred and that I.O. interrupt service routine is being executed. The I.O. device, on the other hand, is again in uh, one of two states. It's either idle or it's transferring. So initially, the I.O. device would be idle and the CPU would be executing a user process. Again, for the sake of the example, let's keep it simple. Let's assume once again, we have a single CPU with a single core, and let's say we have a single process that's executing in the system at the moment. A very simple scenario. So uh, the, the CPU is in the user uh, process executing state, and the I.O. device is idle. At some point, it starts transferring some data. Well, the transfer of that data is not at light striking speed. It will take some time. So it starts IO transfer at this point where my uh, cursor is, mouse cursor is, and it will take some time to transfer that data. When that transfer is done, the uh, IO device will interrupt the CPU saying, I'm ready. The data is ready. Even this interrupt will not happen immediately because the CPU is currently dealing with something. This is just like, for example, while I'm telling something, if you try to interrupt me to ask a question, well, you will have to wait until I finish either describing this thing I'm explaining, this example I'm explaining at this moment, or at least until I finish my sentence. You cannot interrupt me in the middle of a sentence. So it will take a little bit of a delay for the CPU to look at the I.O. device, not immediately. It will not execute, it will not switch 
to that interrupt service routine the moment it's interrupted. After some short delay, the CPU will stop executing the user process, switch to the interrupt service routine, execute that interrupt service routine, and then resume with the user process. Note that it has taken a long time to transfer the information from the I.O. device to the buffer of the I.O. controller, like reading from the disk into not the memory or the CPU, but only to the local buffer of the I.O. device. Let's just remember the figure once again. We're talking about the communication here. The disk, from the disk, you're trying to read into a buffer in the disk controller. This takes a lot of time because this disk is too slow. Okay, when everything has been read into this disk buffer, the disk controller interrupts the CPU. It takes a little bit of time for the CPU to respond to this uh, interrupt service routine, uh, to this interrupt actually. And when it is done with the current process, it will just store that state and return to this controller saying, what's the deal? The disk controller says, I have the data you requested and it will transfer the data from here to the CPU or typically to the memory. The CPU will typically coordinate it or, or get it coordinated. And this transfer operation is typically faster, much faster than the disk itself. So this, this short time is the time the CPU spends in the interrupt service routine. Those interrupt service routines have to be very, very short and they have to run very fast because there will be many such interrupts. If the interrupt service routines are taking too much time, the processes will be, user processes will be adversely affected by this. So we want this to be very fast. So it will uh, handle it and resume back to the user process and deal with it. And the IO device has now completed its task. It's happy and it will just remain idle for a long time. Later, again, when the IO device, for example, uh, it could be the disk or say it's the network card. So again, some IO transfer starts. Again, it takes some long time. Same thing is being repeated. When the data is being transferred into the IO controller's local buffer, after the whole transfer has been done and the IO uh, controller is now ready to transfer it, again, it will interrupt the CPU. Again, it will serve for a short time and then resume. 